everyone. Welcome to Unchained, the podcast where we hear from innovators, pioneers, and thought leaders in the world of blockchain and cryptocurrency. I'm your host, Laura Shin. If you've been enjoying Unchained, pop into iTunes to give us a top rating or review that helps other listeners find the show. And be sure to follow me on Twitter at Laura Shin. Unchained is sponsored by Preciate. Founded by Ed Stevens, Preciate is building the most valuable relationships on earth. In each episode of Unchained, Preciate sponsors the recognition of an individual or group in crypto for an achievement. Who in crypto will be recognized today? Stay tuned to find out. This episode of Unchained is brought to you by Bitwise Asset Management. Last year, Bitwise created the world's first cryptocurrency index fund, the Bitwise Hold 10, which holds the top 10 cryptocurrencies and rebalances monthly. The fund has several hundred LPs and is currently accepting accredited investors. To learn more and invest in the Bitwise Cryptocurrency Index Fund, visit www.bitwiseinvestments.com slash unchained. Today's episode is brought to you by KeepKey, the easy, safe, and simple way to protect your Bitcoin, Ether, Litecoin, and many other digital assets. There's no time like the present to protect yourself from hackers, malware, and viruses. Rest easy knowing that your digital assets are protected. Visit KeepKey.com to order your secure hardware wallet today. Today's guests are Valery Vavilov, the co-founder and CEO of Bitfury, and George Kikvadze, vice chairman of the board. Welcome, Val and George. Hi, Laura. Hi, Laura. Let's start with Val. How did you get into Bitcoin and what were you doing before? Oh, it, it was in 2010 when I was introduced to the Bitcoin first time. And uh, I learned the technology and understood this is not just uh, another cryptocurrency, but this technology can really change this world, can really digitize everything what is not digitized yet because if you look at this world right now we live in a digital world but and we can send uh, information all across the world and uh, from one hand everything is uh, digitized but from another hand anything of value and all our assets are still on paper your house is a paper your car is a paper your company shares is a piece of paper even all of us, it's a piece of paper or piece of plastic. It's your identity card or your passport. So why it's happened? Because Internet was not designed for secure transactions. And uh, blockchain and the cryptocurrency and all this technology is by default designed for secure transactions. So that's why this technology will be able to uh, digitize the most important part, the assets and anything of value. Once I understood it, I put aside all my projects and went in only, uh, only to do this thing. And so 2010 is super, super early. Obviously, Bitcoin, the software only started running in 2009. How did you get introduced to it so early? And what had you been doing before? So before I spent many years to create different kind of uh, registry systems uh, for Latvian municipalities, and uh, did uh, some consulting and startups. Okay. And George, what about you? How did you discover Bitcoin and what had you been doing before? Well, Val and I have a common friend who now runs Bitfury Capital, uh, Marat Kichiko. And uh, Marat kept telling me and bugging me about Bitcoin uh, as early as when price was $10, $20. And you know, obviously, it was uh, early 2012, uh, 2013, that time period. And uh, he kept coming back and coming back is that, you know, th there's this uh, Latvian entrepreneur I'd like you to meet to discuss this cryptocurrency. And uh, we finally met. And, uh, you know, I really liked uh, the idea and the concept. Um, and uh, uh, I did uh, spend a little bit of time. Uh, diving into it and uh, called a couple of my friends that uh, were in Silicon Valley. Uh, and actually, <laughs> the first person that I got connected was uh, Wences of Zappo. And uh, uh, after a brief Patient conversation zero. with him. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and after talking uh, to Wences, uh, you know, I, I realized we had very similar backgrounds and experiences. And, uh, uh, you know, I got a lot of comfort. And obviously, then uh, there was a lot of... Uh, deep diving into, uh, you know, online resources. And I realized that this could be something really huge and uh, uh, decided to join up Val in, in his journey to, uh, uh, to embark on, uh, uh, on this project. 
So I have a somewhat burning question for you guys. And it's surprising to me that I've never asked you before because I know you uh, both, you know, pretty well. And uh, also because people may remember, listeners may remember that one of my first podcast guests was Bill Ty. And near the beginning of his career, he was a chip designer. And during that episode, he told me that the way he came to invest in Bitfury was that he saw Val and I guess the other Bitfury co-founders on this message board. And he noticed that they none of them had a background in chip design, but they wanted to design an ASIC, which is a chip built for a special purpose. And they wanted to build one for Bitcoin mining. And he saw that what you guys built was something truly unique and novel and that you were able to do that because you didn't have the sort of background in conventional chip design that someone like him uh, would have had. And I just, I never found out later whether or not that story is true or whether he had, you know, because obviously he wasn't like in the middle of it. And so I, I just always wanted to find out from you guys how Bitfury got founded. Uh, yeah, you know, this uh, this story about uh, the chip design is uh, really interesting because it was our first chip and we went uh, all in uh, to create this full custom chip. And full custom chip, uh, it's very hard to do because you literally need to create your own transistors. Uh, and uh, because we didn't have, uh, we didn't have uh, experience before, we just didn't know what it's impossible and you know when you don't know what it's impossible you think it's possible and you just do it <laughs> and we did it and it's worked and uh, yeah but it was a very interesting journey and uh, uh, now, now now we created already I think uh, six generation of chips but this first chip was was yeah was a very interesting story and we collected money from friends and family so the first investments uh, was very hard to get because I reached uh, to some of the investors, created the business plan, uh, uh, told, um, told about uh, Bitcoin, about cryptocurrency, about blockchain, but nobody believed, nobody believed uh, in, uh, <laughs> back in 2012 and 2011. So we just collected uh, money from friends and families uh, who believed in our story and uh, yeah, went all in and uh, here we are now. We're a company, global company, with the people from sixteen countries and uh, more than five hundred people. Oh wow! Yeah, that was actually going to be my next question. How many employees you have? And so you have more than five hundred. And how many? And you have sixteen offices, or uh, not really sixteen offices, but uh, people from sixteen countries. Uh, offices okay. in uh, Amsterdam, San Francisco, DC, London, Tokyo, Tbilisi. Uh, Canada, Norway, and so on. Yeah, and also, where are your mining operations? So our main uh, mining operations are in uh, Republic of Georgia, uh, in Iceland, in uh, Canada, and in Norway. And how do you choose where to locate a mining center? So first of all is energy price, business climate, cold weather. But uh, the uh, most important parameter is the uh, energy price and uh, uh, green energy because we as a company are committed to lower the uh, carbon uh, footprint. Uh, that's why we're choosing locations with the cheap energy but uh, green energy. And how do you define green energy? Green energy is the re renewable energy, for example, hydro, thermo, and uh, everything renewable. Okay, well, yeah, I was going to ask you about that. So I noticed that you have these new mining centers that you're opening in Canada. And by the way, they're in <laughs> what I think are some of the most interestingly named towns I've ever seen, like the city of Medicine Hat. And the other one that caught my eye is Drumheller, which is actually nicknamed the dinosaur capital of the world. And I was so excited by this. And I wanted to... Um, publicly ask you guys to to um, invite me to do some sort of story that involves me going to the dinosaur capital of the world. That would be amazing. <laughs> um, but I I actually was curious about that because I think in that area, what, what kind of energy is it? I looked it up and it looked like in those areas, they use a lot of natural gas. And I wondered how green that was. In Canada, they are using a lot of natural gas. Yes. 
So I, I don't know the carbon footprint of natural gas, but I presume it's not zero. Uh, carbon footprint, uh, footprint on uh, natural gas, uh, I think is not zero, but uh, it's plus minus, okay. And it's much better than the dirty coal that is being burnt in, uh, you know, in many locations around the world, unfortunately. Right. Like China, which is, I think, so I, I've not looked into this, um, but obviously one of your biggest competitors is Bitmain and they have a lot of operations in China. Um, I, I actually, so I don't want to make any claims as to what types of energy they're using, but let's just talk about kind of the moves that you are making in general in the wider context of what's going on in the mining world. You now have a 49% stake in HUT8, which is a Canadian company that now controls or will eventually control 35 Bitcoin mining centers in North America. And it's also now publicly traded on the Toronto Stock Exchange. Why did you decide to partner with HUT8 and how does this move fit into your overall strategy? That's a very good question. So, you know, I think, uh, you know, if you go back uh, four or five years ago when there were a lot of chip companies, uh, key to success were two factors, Laura. It was um, execution on the chip and keeping the promise. It was very important, uh, but also uh, no less important was the access to uh, capital. And I think it was very tough for us to go and convince uh, investors in the Silicon Valley and, uh, you know, other uh, institutional investors to invest because they would see other companies coming in claiming they had better technology. We now know that um, you know all of these companies are uh, extinct or have pivoted away, but they have costed us a lot of traction and they've costed us a lot of um, resources in order to accelerate the deployment and uh, you know global expansion. Uh, as a result of that, if if you look back for the last four years, we have really funded ourselves through. Angel investors such as Bill Tai um, and uh, and friends, um, uh, as well as bootstrapping. In other words, taking the bitcoins that we mined, selling them on exchanges, and then reinvesting in a business. We calculated actually that had we found um, someone with deep pockets that believed in our story and bet on our technology uh, in the same way that Bill Tai um, has has done so, but with large stash of capital. Uh, you know, uh, we would have uh, spent roughly 350 million U.S. dollars on uh, chip designs, on wafers, on electricity costs, on the capex of rolling out. But we would be sitting right now on 860,000 bitcoins. Wow. So that is that is the equation. And, uh, you know, to all the VCs that uh, didn't believe or didn't take that bet, uh, you know, understand it was early in the game. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, that is an outcome. So in this case where you keep executing, but you don't have an access to capital, it's as good as, you know, moving down the highway at a 20, 30 miles per hour. So I think one of the success stories of our uh, Chinese competitors has been not only, uh, you know, executing, uh, but also ability to access the capital from a local, uh, much more risk tolerant sources. Uh, whether it's government, non-government, it's a different story. But, you know, at the end of the day, they've been able to do that. And that's the difference between ordering uh, 10,000 wafers or 50,000 wafers. So what HUD-8 does for us is for the first time um, allows us to partner up with credible institutions. And in this round, we had some 57, uh, uh, you know, large institutions, uh, including, uh, uh, you know, uh, some extremely well-known and regarded international uh, uh, players, it allows us to go and raise capital from institutions and for us then to take that capital and to deploy that to uh, uh, build out the you know, world's largest crypto mining facilities in Bitcoin, in Ethereum, in uh, you know, Zcash, Monero, and other sort of major protocols that we believe uh, will, uh, you know, will, will be uh, of interest to institutions. So HUD-8 is in essence is creating an institutional structure Whereas, uh, you know, long-term capital can come in and fund the acceleration and development of Bitfury and locating the crypto mining in uh, places where there is rule of law, in places where uh, your assets will not be nationalized, in places where your assets will not be brought down some corrupt bureaucrats, and in places where you will be able to build around the know-how centers, the excellence centers, and develop really long-term relationships with local academia and, and governments uh, to embark on this uh, amazing story. Story of blockchain. That's interesting. So everything that you said 
makes sense to me and and sounds smart in terms of strategy against your competitors. But one thing that caught my attention was you said you want to build the the largest mining operation. So how do you do that at the same time that you don't add to the centralization of these cryptocurrencies? Because one thing that's a little bit different from you guys as a mining operation compared to your competitors is that you don't operate what's known as a mining pool in the sense that you don't have individual investors or other institutions that rent or I don't know if rent is the word, but, you know, kind of own a slice of of what you're mining and then get a payout from that. Everything, as far as I understand, all the block rewards that you mine go to you. So that is even more centralized than one of these pool operators where the uh, the components of their pool are individuals who can easily move to another pool if they feel like it and therefore reduce the power of that mining operation. That's a very good question. So uh, from from the standpoint of uh, centralization, obviously, we are super cautious uh, about this. You know, we learned through our mistakes. If you remember, four years ago, there was a debacle with GHash.io. Uh, and, uh, you know, that that was a learning experience. And you're absolutely right. The, the, the philosophy of you know, the uh, Bitcoin uh, protocol is decentralization. So obviously, we're not talking about developing through HOT8 a, uh, you know, a super dominant, uh, you know, crypto mining facility that will command some uh, 40, 30, or even 20%. You know, I think the target would be to shoot for something at 10, 15%. And in regards to the pools, we will be uh, announcing our, uh, you know, public pools. And actually, if you look at... uh, uh, the um, hash rate that's attributable to Bitfury, it's actually, it's a magnitude less than all the equipment that has been sold to the third parties, primarily to the, uh, you know, family offices and, you know, uh, uh, more of the institutions and those that have been allocated to uh, throughout the network via um, other pools. So we actually are super conscious of the decentralization and we're super conscious of spreading around the mining capacity, uh, you know, across the, across the border. Tell me more about that, about, uh, I guess, institutions that are buying. Are you, are you talking about your block box? Is that what they're buying? If so, explain what that is, um, because I don't know if I fully understand. I, I, I believe individuals cannot buy mining equipment from you. But at the same time, I believe you do sell these block boxes, but I'm not sure what the situation is. So we are focusing mostly on a B2B business and, uh, you know, the minimum entry point is a uh, uh, million, uh, million uh, plus. Uh, so from that angle, we have several wealthy in- individuals that have bought and located these block boxes uh, around the globe, as well as we have, you know, teamed up with some uh, corporate players, uh, you know, that have bought 5, 10, 20 uh, uh, 40 uh, in some cases. Uh, we've built, uh, you know, large data centers for, in sort of a corporate uh, players. Uh, so we are not selling, uh, you know, our equipment to, uh, you know, mom and pop, so to speak. We're, we're not uh, we're not on a B2C side. I think there are, uh, you know, there are players that are addressing that market, but we are building the capacity uh, and expanding on capacity, working on a, on a B2B and, um, you know, addressing a corporate and increasingly looking to address the government sector, given our reputation, corporate governance and the relationship that we have. I think there's a place for everybody. We're going to discuss your summits on Necker Island and your new product, Crystal, and more. But first, I'd like to take a quick break to tell you about our fabulous sponsors. Founded by Ed Stevens, Preshade is building the most valuable relationships on earth. In each episode of Unchained, Preshade sponsors the recognition of an individual or group in crypto for an achievement. Today, Preshade is recognizing Caitlin Long, a blockchain leader who helped drive recent legislative advances in the Wyoming legislature. On her website, Caitlin mentions many others who contributed to the project as well. For that, Caitlin gets kudos for sharing kudos. Thanks to Caitlin and to everyone who helped her get a big win in Wyoming. Listeners, if you know someone in crypto who should be recognized in a future episode of Unchained, take action and go to preciate.org slash recognize. That's preciate.org slash recognize. Cryptocurrency is vibrant and exciting, but it's not without its share of bad actors. Exchanges and personal accounts can get hacked. Computers can be infected with malware. Left unprotected, your digital wealth is up for grabs. Don't let yourself be a victim. KeepKey is the safest and simplest way to protect your Bitcoin, Ether, Litecoin, and other tokenized assets. This hardware wallet is a separate device that you control. Brought to you by the pioneering team at ShapeShift. 
KeepKey works with the wallet software on your computer to manage your private keys and transactions. Your device is PIN protected, which renders it useless even if it falls into the wrong hands. Its large display lets you carefully view and approve every transaction. And if your Keep Key is ever lost or stolen, you can safely recover your device without compromising its private keys. The bottom line? You'll sleep easier knowing that your digital wealth is safe and secure. Visit KeepKey.com to order yours today. Works on PC, Mac, Linux, and Android. Bitwise Asset Management is the creator of the world's first cryptocurrency index fund, the Bitwise Hold 10. The fund holds the top 10 cryptocurrencies by five-year diluted market cap, rebalances monthly, and takes care of secure storage and taxes. It's an easy, secure way for long-term investors to get diversified exposure. Bitwise is backed by Kosla Ventures, General Catalyst, Blockchain Capital, Naval Ravikant, and several others. They're a trusted partner to individual investors, wealth managers, family offices, and large institutions who are navigating the crypto space. The fund has several hundred LPs and is currently accepting accredited investors. To learn more about the Bitwise Cryptocurrency Index Fund or download research, visit www.bitwiseinvestments.com slash unchained. I'm speaking with Valeri Vavilov and George Kikvadze of Bitfury. So let's talk about your expansion to other cryptocurrencies. As you mentioned before, you will be mining other crypto assets from Bitcoin, although I do believe at least up until now, it's it's been mostly Bitcoin or maybe even only Bitcoin that you've mined. How uh, will you decide which other cryptocurrencies to mine and have you decided which other ones to mine yet? Yeah, we're working on solutions uh, for other cryptocurrencies. Uh, so we can... Um... We will update on this once it's ready. But uh, we are thinking about this and uh, we're working uh, to deploy these solutions for other cryptocurrencies. And why have you decided to expand now? I mean, you were very much focused as a company on Bitcoin for quite a long time. Because because we see there is a need for equipment for other cryptocurrencies and we see what uh, uh, in the space of uh, public blockchains, there will be no uh, not only one public blockchain, there will be uh, several public blockchains. So that's why we decided to move to this direction as well. And did you are you going to do the same as you did with Bitcoin, where you develop specialized chips for each blockchain? Uh, either specialized chips or specialized uh, custom equipment uh, that uh, efficiently mine and uh, process transactions of uh, different alt- altcoins, yeah. And you plan to do the same where you open your own data centers and maybe you tap the BNB, B2B market a little bit? <laughs> or BNB. Yeah, the biz- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, B- B- um, B- yeah. <laughs> the, the business model will be the same as uh, as now. We will sell to, okay. to, to high net worth individuals, to institutions, and uh, and the most likely we'll, we'll mine some small part uh, to ourselves as well. The price of Bitcoin, at least right now, as of uh, at least at the time of this recording, has fallen from the highs it saw in late 2017 of nearly $20,000 to around 8000 And as we know from like the 2014 and 2015 years, there have been periods where Bitcoin has sort of dwindled down after a big run-up. What's the lowest price you can mine at and still be profitable? So it depends, uh, of course, the location, uh, because the price is dependent on energy price. <clears throat> but uh, just uh, uh, preliminary calculations shows but uh, it's something like $2,500 bit, uh, $2, per Bitcoins. 2500 maybe $3,000 per Bitcoin. It depends on the location. Oh, wow. Okay, so it, it looks like you guys still have quite a bit of runway. Well, I was curious, do you normally sell your Bitcoins immediately after the 100 blocks? Uh, because I know, for, I guess, if you mine, then you can't sell the, the block reward, the Bitcoins that you win from mining a, a block. You can't sell them for at least 100 blocks. So do you normally sell them immediately or do you keep them as long as you can or what's the strategy there no we don't have a particular let's say strategy we, we are not we definitely not not selling immediately but we are selling from time to time uh, to keep the cash balance as far as i understand after 
starting in hardware. You expanded your services to software services, and I believe you were selling them mostly to governments. For instance, you have been working with the government in Georgia to put the land titling system there on the Bitcoin blockchain or or to develop a system that you know can at least put a hash of the records on the Bitcoin blockchain. Why did you decide to go in that direction of offering blockchain services for governments? You know, because um, uh, when we started to talk to regulators and decision makers, we understood that uh, there will be there will be no fast move uh, of institutions and governments to public blockchain. Um, just like uh, the same happened 20 years ago when internet was created. Yeah, uh, the institutions and governments uh, didn't switch to internet immediately yeah they, yes they, they, they told the technology is okay the technology is perfect but we don't know who is using this uh, technology we don't know who owned this technology we will use this technology and we'll create our own intranets yeah and uh, after a lot of intranets was created uh, they interconnected it uh, using internet when they become more comfortable with the technology. The same is happening in the blockchain space. There is a public blockchains, but uh, to move to public blockchain, institution need to be to become more comfortable. And to become more comfortable, they need intermediary step. An intermediary step is the private blockchain. So that's why in 2015 we decided, okay. Uh, there is a need for such a solution, uh, and uh, this solution also will help to to expand uh, um, the awareness of public blockchain. We decided to put some money and create the framework for private blockchain. And uh, that's how we created the platform called Exonom. And now using Exonom platform, uh, you can use it uh, to blockchainize uh, any government uh, services, uh, uh, institutions can use it, or different kind of organizations can use it. It's some kind of operation, operating systems uh, that uh, you can use to easily deploy blockchain, private blockchain solutions to your organization. But uh, still, uh, you know, every private blockchain is just a software. That's why we're using uh, Bitcoin blockchain as a security layer uh, to secure the private blockchain with so-called anchoring. Earlier, you were talking about how for your mining business, you've decided to focus on the B2B business, and you could have done the same here. And it sounds like Exonum you know, was a step in that direction, but I know Exonum was announced, I believe, last year, and your work with governments started quite a bit before then. So why did you focus on governments initially? You know, because uh, government, uh, you you could uh, you could put it this way, you can put put the government as the one of the biggest service providers for the citizens, because every government provides thousands of different of services to its citizens. Uh, most of the services are very inefficient. Uh, for example, land title registration. Yeah, to 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 do the land title registration. You need to go to different third parties. You need to get different type type, uh, type of uh, checks and balances, uh, papers, and so on and so forth. And from country to country, this process could take from few days to few months just to do one operation. Why it's happening? Uh, because you don't trust the systems. You don't trust the data in the systems. And every time you do this transaction, you need you need to do these checks again and again and again. What blockchain and how blockchain can help? Blockchain uh, can add this trust because once you place data on a, on a blockchain, it cannot be deleted and it cannot be altered. By this, you don't need to check the same operation again and again once the data on the blockchain. And um, this is not only for land title buff, but for any other uh, service uh, what you are getting from the government. And we believe that with the help of the blockchain, uh, any government could reduce, first of all, the cost of each service and could reduce the time of each service. That will make the government much, much more efficient. And Val, I believe you have 
personal experience with government not working for the citizens, and I've heard you talk before about how you believe that at least in some in some governments or in some countries that is it's always the case. And can you tell listeners your personal story with government not working for its citizens? Yeah, you know, I I born uh, I was born in Latvia. Latvia is a small country with population roughly two million people. It was part of Soviet Union. Now it's uh, part of uh, European Union. And um, when the uh, Soviet Union collapsed, uh, I think I was twelve uh, by this time. Uh, my parents and uh, parents of a lot of my friends just literally lost everything. Uh, money become paper. Um, and uh, they lost the pensions and so on and so forth. And uh, I was very small, but I felt it. Yeah, because uh, one <laughs> one day uh, my mother told me, "Okay, no more toys, <laughs> no more toys anymore." <laughs> so, uh, but may, um, but as a technologist, uh, and uh, I'm in computer science since uh, I'm uh, I was eight. I always thought, okay, how can I use uh, the technology? Uh, to to make the systems to work for the people, uh, because many ta- many years after the uh, this uh, uh, this happened uh, with me uh, with my family and, uh, and with a lot of families in our countries, I understood okay why it's happened because of the systems that were not designed to work for the people. And you know when in 2010 uh, I learned about cryptocurrency and in 2011 I understood uh, what this uh, this technology could be used not only to move money but to digitize the assets and to add trust into untrusted networks I understood this is the perfect technology to make any institutions to make any system work for the people and to make any system uh, to be trusted because what is happening right now, for example, in a lot of countries, I, I know in U.S., in Europe, all the systems working plus minus fine, yeah, and you can trust land title registration and so on. You can move fa- money uh, quite quite fast uh, from bank to bank, but in majority of the countries in this world and uh, from the part of the world uh, world uh, where I am from, people can lose properties and uh, land titles just because somebody changing records in a database and uh, this is a huge this is a really huge issue because if you if you are for example some sysadmin you are taking uh, making a small sale salary and the country is corrupt and the system is corrupt somebody can <laughs> can can go and negotiate with you and you are just changing records and uh, the owner of the i don't know company the owner of the property is the different owner and there are a lot of such cases uh, all around the world. Uh, so with the help of the blockchain, it become impossible. So it is solving this global, uh, glo- global, global issue. So this is the perfect segue for us to talk about the Necker Island Blockchain Summit that you co-host with Bill Tai, and which I've had the honor of attending now twice. Thank you for those invitations. So for me... Obviously, I've been to a ton of different crypto and blockchain conferences, but as I've definitely, I don't remember if I've told you directly, but I've told at least some of the other organizers that this conference for me sticks out because you guys don't invite all the same people that attend all the other crypto conferences. You get pretty creative and strategic, I think, with your choices for instance, at the most recent summit, there was the president of the of Conservation International, who, um, you know, was wonderful, uh, but, you know, she fully admitted, oh, I don't know a ton about blockchain technology. There was uh, an officer from the Rockefeller Foundation, and these people were mixed in along with crypto insiders like Vinny Lingam and Sandra Rowe and Michael Casey. But how do you select who you're going to bring in? What's your goal in bringing together a, a group that's that eclectic? First of all, we want to create the mix of the people, uh, part of the people who clearly understand the technology from different angles, and the second part of the people who are the global decision makers uh, or regulators or just a very important person who can uh, make an impact. And uh, 
the education is a key yes yeah, so the biggest issue in our industry and in any new technology such as disruptive technology as a blockchain is the lack of education so you need to educate people you need to explain them why this technology is so important how this technology can change our lives better how this technology really can make systems uh, work for the people and change this uh, world uh, to be a better place and the necker island is perfect uh, location uh, because first of all of uh, uh, richard branson energy itself uh, creates this island so that you start thinking completely differently you uh, your mind your mind on this uh, island just opening and uh, when you are living in this uh, island for the four days with all the people a lot of uh, interesting uh, ideas uh, uh, came into action and um, one of the most important component of course the education exchange of ideas and when all these people from let's say two different world, worlds here yeah, from world of uh, technology and uh, uh, different world uh, they come together and uh, discuss different cases some some good ideas happening yeah yeah, well, let's talk about some of the things that's that have come out of the summit because there have been so many. And it's kind of interesting to look back because, you know, at the time it's just kind of like, oh, we have this idea. We're going to try to bring this group together for, I mean, I could list a whole bunch. It's like the blockchain trust accelerator, which, so I'm just going to list all these and, you know, please define them for the listeners. There's the global blockchain business council. There's the blockchain alliance. I feel like there are others I probably missed, but why don't you, for the listeners, kind of list what they all are and what these organizations are doing? Yeah, so Blockchain Alliance is the perfect example. Um, the Blockchain Alliance is the organization that literally was born on Necker Island. Um, and uh, why this organization was created? Because when such a disruptive technology is happening, the worst thing what could happen is the uh, not smart regulation. Regulation is good, but regulation for such a disruptive technology should be very smart. It's like, uh, you know, uh, you have uh, rails, you have an old train, what is uh, uh, using these rails to uh, move around some uh, something, and you create a completely new train, Hyperloop with magnetic fields, uh, very high speed, and so on. So for the new ra for the new train, you cannot use the old old rails. Otherwise, this new train will be as efficient as the old one. So for the new train, you need to create completely new rails. Yeah, and um, this organization was very important to join together industry experts and uh, law enforcement and regulators so that when law enforcement and regulators have some questions or have some issues uh, they always uh, have uh, industry experts who are ready to help who are ready to answer the questions who are ready to find the solution together uh, and who are ready to uh, help how to uh, solve it without uh, doing uh, some I don't know things what uh, not need to be done. Yeah, actually, so listeners should go back and listen to that episode I did with Jason Weinstein and Alan Cohn of the Blockchain Alliance because it was a very interesting episode, and they talk a little bit more about the origin story of it. And apparently, I think the idea literally came about while some of some people on Necker Island were hanging out in a bath in a uh, in a hot tub. <laughs> I almost said bathtub. Definitely not a bathtub. <laughs> Um, but anyway, so, um, yeah, it's, it's a very interesting story. And actually this also now is a good segue to talk about your new product that you announced crystal, which is a blockchain analytics tool for law enforcement. And as you described it in medium, it quote, uses advanced analytics and data scraping to map suspicious transactions and related entities. So how do you know if a transaction is suspicious? And then what data are you scraping there? 
We analyzing uh, a lot of public data on different forums, uh, on uh, social networks, and uh, uh, we created uh, some sophisticated algorithms uh, to analyze the transactions to untangle uh, mixed uh, transactions. Uh, uh, so with this kind of algorithm, you significantly increase uh, probability uh, of understanding uh, where these uh, bitcoins are coming from. But this tool, um, also we spent almost two years to create this tool. And uh, the idea of creation of this tool was after discussing with uh, banks, uh, institutions and uh, different companies, after discussing what is Bitcoin, yeah, and uh, we understood, okay, Bitcoin is, from one hand, is very transparent system, uh, all transactions are fixed on the blockchain, but it's so hard for institutions to use this. It's like uh, using MS-DOS comparing to uh, Win Windows or Mac OS, yeah. And that's why, um, you know, by uh, with the help of this tool, you're just creating a very easy to use instrument to to give a comfort, to give a comfort uh, to law enforcement, uh, to banks, to hedge funds, uh, to insurance companies, and other organization who just want to uh, see where those bitcoins are coming from. And uh, I think this this tool will help to. Uh, to get this comfort to the institutions. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, one important thing here is that the gene is out of bottle. You know, we are in hundreds of billions of uh, value for the crypto assets. And increasingly, more and more individuals are uh, sort of asking their financial institutions to allow them uh, to buy cryptocurrencies, to trade cryptocurrencies. And obviously, post-2008, the financial institutions have been laden with uh, you know, a lot of compliance and they have, they do have a lot of headaches in terms of dealing. So if you come up with a product that, uh, you know, works, that is, uh, you know, that adds value, we see a humongous opportunity to go in and address, uh, you know, to basically uh, solve a, a choke point with uh, financial institutions, with, uh, uh, you know, insurance companies, there's some healthcare applications, uh, you know, data analytics, uh, you know, and obviously law enforcement. And what we're seeing is one of the myths of uh, Bitcoins has always been, you know, Bitcoin for criminal money. But actually, if you dig deeper, uh, the Bitcoin uh, usage of Bitcoin by criminals, as, uh, you know, Jason Weinstein, our board advisor, has, uh, you know, said, you know, if you're a criminal, you should... Uh, not just walk away, we should run away from Bitcoin. And, and surely uh, the illicit activities of the cryptos have moved to other protocols which are uh, much more uh, anonymous uh, than Bitcoin. But Crystal is really a solution for you know, for a huge, uh, uh, you know, financial industry opportunity, uh, you know, alongside the law enforcement, which uh, we believe uh, is, is, is uh, there is a need for that and, and there will be, an in, you know, uh, there, there's a lot of synergies in, in that work. And what are the financial institutions wanting to do with the Bitcoin blockchain? Because as far as I understand, at least from the headlines that we see on CNBC and other sites like that, a lot of the heads of these companies are sort of disavowing Bitcoin and, um, you know, saying they won't let their uh, customers trade in it and stuff like that. So who of them are interested in using yeah, this? Yeah, you know, they're disavowing that they come back and apologize for that. So, but, you know, at the end of the day, <laughs> you see a uberization of the industry, right? I mean, you can have... Uh, uh, head of a post office uh, saying that, uh, you know, I, I don't like email, but if the constituents are coming and saying, hey, can you install, you know, PCs in your uh, uh, post office so I can be sending email, you know, in democratic countries, you know, it's a bottoms up, it's the grassroots movement. And that's what we're saying. So when you uh, have, uh, you know, massive amount of folks coming in and bugging their uh, bank officers from the standpoint of buying cryptos and such, uh, you know, there is obviously a demand from the population. And I think, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a matter of coming in with a solution to the compliance officers and to the banks that addresses those needs that, uh, you know, allows them to satisfy that demand. Because if that is not satisfied in one jurisdiction, you're going to have regulatory arbitrage. Uh, and uh, I think everybody is, is aware of that. So we believe there is a huge opportunity to be pioneers, to uh, entrench ourselves and to, uh, you know, build out this uh, industry. Yeah, I guess we are seeing that already, at least in the ICO space. We're all, not all, but a bunch of ICOs are 
moving to Switzerland. Um, but I actually wanted to go back because Val said something about looking at mixed transactions. And I, I wasn't sure what he meant by that. What, what, how do you define mixed transactions? I mean, there are different uh, mixers where people uh, send transactions from different wallets uh, to one wallet and mix it uh, from this one wallet, started to send it to different other wallets. So, and trying to, you know, mix the transactions. So, um, I don't know if I explained um, a sort correctly, of like money but, uh, laundering or something. Not really, but uh, just to. Cover to up obfuscate the, the trail. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And but I heard that the they were improving, that the mixers were improving and it was at least I mean this was a while back but Catherine Hahn on my podcast uh, who you guys also know, um she said that they were improving to the point where law enforcement was not able to um to untangle them but but obviously that was a year and a half ago and so now is your technology good enough to to untangle those? So it's not 100%, but uh, th with this technology, you can increase uh, probability of uh, untangling the transaction. And so I know the product is fairly new, but do you have customers yet? And if so, who are they for Crystal? Uh, we are not disclosing our customers right now, uh, but we have uh, uh, several customers uh, who are using the tool uh, in uh, as a, as a better bet version, yeah. Okay, so I did see online there were some critics of the tool for privacy reasons. What do you say to people who criticize this product for that? Uh, depends what kind of privacy reason. <laughs> well, I, I didn't pull any quotes, um, but obviously if you are tracking the transactions and scraping data and stuff like that, I think maybe that's what they're referring to. But uh, Bitcoin blockchain, this tool is uh, doesn't do anything new, yeah. Because Bitcoin blockchain is transparent by default, so you can do it without this tool. Uh, but it's much more complicated. Uh, this tool just provides you user friendly interface to do so, so that you That's spend, true. for example, for <laughs> tracking not hours but seconds. Okay. Yeah, I guess I guess that does make sense. This reminds me of how. In that episode with with Katie, she basically said, "Yeah, I, I, it's better if if the criminals use Bitcoin." <laughs> you know, the um, best the best days for law enforcement will be when all the criminals of this world will will, will start using Bitcoin. It will be the best days <laughs> for law enforcement because, from starting from this moment, all of the bad guys will be traceable. Yes. And actually, for anybody who didn't listen to that episode, you should go back and check it out because Katie did track down a few very, very interesting crimes with the blockchain. And she described how she actually realized that the crimes she was seeing were being perpetrated by two people, not one, because she could see a difference in their behavior using the blockchain. So it was it was very interesting. Um, but let's actually circle back to Exonum, which you had talked about earlier. This is your enterprise blockchain product. Who is using that? So right now we have uh, dozens of uh, pilot projects uh, going on. It's still early stage. Uh, we launched a land title uh, registration uh, in the Republic of Georgia. Uh, we launched a few projects uh, in Ukraine. And uh, we have a dozens of uh, commercial projects uh, what are happening in uh, pilot stage right now. And the way you described it earlier, it's a private blockchain where they secure it by maybe putting hashes of the transactions on the Bitcoin blockchain? Yeah, so how it's working. Um, from time to time, we're doing snapshot of this private blockchain, let's say every 10 minutes or every hour. And we're putting the hash code of the full snapshot of the private blockchain as a Bitcoin blockchain transaction to the Bitcoin blockchain. And by this, Bitcoin blockchain uh, becomes a so-called independent auditor of the private blockchain. And if something happens inside private blockchain, for example, all the nodes negotiate uh, between each other to change the records, they cannot negotiate with Bitcoin blockchain. And you will see immediately what something happened wrong in private blockchain yeah not in five years not, not, yeah not in three years when it's too late but in 10 minutes 
<laughs> yes. So one thing that I was curious about is, is it difficult to persuade companies to use this blockchain software or to to adopt uh, blockchain technology or even use something that touches the Bitcoin blockchain? Because if I look at the pace of innovation in the public and private blockchain spaces, it's like no contest. The enterprise stuff is moving at a snail's pace. Generally, there isn't a ton to show for it yet. And then, you know, obviously, <laughs> with the Bitcoin, or it's not not Bitcoin, but the uh, public blockchain space, uh, just things take off at lightning speed often. So do you think enterprise clients are moving at a pace quickly enough to keep themselves from being disrupted? Yeah, a lot of enterprise uh, are moving to use uh, blockchain because uh, a lot of them understand the value of blockchain. Blockchain uh, can significantly uh, improve uh, all business processes because you will not need to spend time on uh, papers. You will not need to spend time on uh, third-party checks uh, and so on. Of course, there are co companies that are are concerned about the technology that uh, thinks what it's uh, some kind of hype but uh, it's always like this with new technologies there will be always uh, fast movers and there 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 will be always uh, followers but uh, the companies who who will be first in the line they will get uh, uh competitive advantage huh, okay yeah i mean it makes sense they're in it for the efficiency gains so one other thing I wanted to ask you about in this department was you're helping with the pilot that the State Department and Coca-Cola are doing to use a blockchain for labor rights. And as far as I understand, I think what problem they're trying to solve is that migrant workers sometimes sign contracts that promise one set of working conditions in their home country, let's say. And then when they move to the other country where they're supposed to work, they are they can be subject to worse working conditions, but then they have no recourse or proof that the employer isn't holding up their end of the agreement. And, you know, maybe, I mean, they're just not in their home country. They're maybe they don't know what resources they have or they don't speak the language. So um, this, you, you know, obviously these are big names, Coca-Cola and State Department. How do you convince large institutions like these to test out something this experimental? Well, I mean, I think this goes back to, uh, the one of the projects that was born out of Necker uh, and Blockchain Trust Accelerator. And I think one of the important aspects of blockchain is really uh, social good. You know, we truly believe that this technology will transform the world, uh, will make it more transparent, open and accountable. Um, as such, uh, you know, one of the uh, key projects that emerged out of this was uh, BTA uh, and together in partnerships with National Democrat Institute, as well as uh, the New America Foundation, and uh, the team has been very successful uh, bringing in additional players. And one of the uh, projects that uh, you know are uh, part of the BTA is exactly the the one you just described, Laura. I think this is a very important project. Uh, you know, it will be impactful to you know thousands of migrant workers, and we believe that it will act as a template for many other companies that are responsible and are looking to address these issues to take on and um, spread it like a wildfire. Great. So let's now switch to talking about this new blockchain that you guys have been talking about a lot, which I believe is also involved in the Coca Cola and State Department project. And it's called Emmercoin. What is Emmercoin and why are you guys so interested in it? Sure. So basically, Emmercoin is a technology which allows you to provide services on blockchain uh, uh, very efficiently. And um, our chief security officer, Alex Petrov, is really the guy that uh, got to know the technologies behind uh, this project some two years ago and got fascinated by what they were doing and uh, brought this to our attention. Uh, I think from the standpoint of uh, Bitfury's investment, uh, it's a strategic investment for us. We see uh, that Emmercoin can be uh, complementary to Exonum. And what we also see is that uh, Emmercoin as a platform, uh, as the one that's being merged mined to uh, Bitcoin blockchain is something that, uh, you know, is very interesting. And from the security standpoint, uh, I just want to point out also, we are big supporters of Rootstock project, which uh, also, uh, you know, enabler of the smart contract, but it's also merged mined to the Bitcoin blockchain. So, 
is we are expanding and we're looking at various protocols and applications. Uh, we really look at the teams. We really look at uh, the value they can add. And Emercoin stood out from the standpoint of uh, what it can accomplish. And uh, we took on this uh, project uh, some three months ago. So I know you guys travel the world quite a bit. Um, obviously, <laughs> you have offices all over the world. And we uh, listeners didn't hear, but before the show started, we were joking about how they were the international men of mining. I think I, <laughs> I think I was saying, um, but then we were joking about how they like to call themselves a transaction processing company, but decided international men of transaction processing does not sound anywhere near as sexy. <laughs> but because I know you guys have this big global view of what's happening in a lot of different areas in crypto right now, I was curious to hear where you see the future of crypto headed. What do you think the next one to two years in the space will look like? You know, um, next uh, few years, I think we will see exponential growth of, of implementation of different blockchain uh, systems and use of cryptocurrency. And uh, yeah, we are traveling a lot. We are um, meeting with a lot of decision makers in different uh, parts of this world, different countries. And you know what is interesting? I never see any person who understood, who after, after um, uh, understanding what cryptocurrency is and what blockchain is, say it's some kind of, uh, I don't know, hype or something. Every, every, every single person who understood the technology said, yes, this is great. This really uh, can change uh, um, our world and the systems uh, in the most efficient way. Yeah, I think Bitcoin has sort of passed the point of no return. Uh, you know, now it's about the speed of adoption. And what is so powerful about this technology is that it's really not driven by Silicon Valley. If you look about it, it's really a global phenomenon. And it's driven by, you know, coders from, you know, China and Japan and, uh, you know, Europe and, you know, obviously America and, uh, you know, uh, Middle East and uh, many other parts of the world, South America. So, uh, you know, it's a global phenomenon. It's open source. And it's, it's really... Uh, amazing to see you know we have some 100 uh, coders and programmers that are working day and night on you know various applications of blockchain and you're just seeing you know these young brilliant kids you know phds in mathematics winners of international chess olympias that are coming and coding and and creating so uh, you know this is the uh, technology i believe that uh, is going to have much more powerful impact than internet. And I believe it, it is uh, a technology that will uh, transform the world in a significant way. Uh, the uh, most important innovations, uh, to uh, answer your question, I think uh, the implications of Lightning Network, we haven't even fathomed what will be the, uh, you know, the significance of this uh, uh, innovation. We think that it will have paramount uh, influence on numerous industries, from payment rails to, uh, you know, media uh, advertising to IoT sector. Um, and uh, the promise of Lightning is uh, is gathering a lot of speed. You know, we are huge supporters and contributors, uh, you know, uh, to, to this. And I believe uh, year 2018 will be the year of the Lightning, um, and year uh, 2018-19 will be uh, an inflection point where Bitcoin starts starts going from uh, OECD countries really to the billions in emerging markets because we truly believe this technology is meant for the emerging markets where the friction of payments and assets is the highest, where the uh, friction of corruption and lack of transparency is the highest. And uh, we really believe that this is a technology for the billions and next two years you will start seeing that shift occurring where the benefits of this technology will start being enjoyed by the peoples in India and Indonesia and in uh, you know uh, Argentina and Brazil and uh, you know uh, Russia and uh, you know uh, Nigeria uh, and you know in, in, in huge huge numbers. Well actually before we go one other thing I wanted to ask about, is I believe we're seeing kind of a wide range of reactions from governments to um, cryptocurrency. And I noted that obviously you just opened this mining center in Norway and the, uh, it appears the, the minister of trade or something was even at the ceremony. And I looked up where the 
mining center is located and is very it's not like near Oslo or anything it looks like it was kind of a trek but it's in a remote area and you know I feel like the fact that he went there was pretty significant so that sort of shows an openness on the part of the Norwegian government and then at the same time I know that uh, recently there was this small town in New York Plattsburgh that banned Bitcoin mining because I guess a number of miners descended upon the small town and some of the people the residents were contending that the mining operations were raising everyone's electric bills. So are, what is the range of reactions that you're seeing when it comes to governments? So we've been super selective in terms of identifying which uh, countries to go and, uh, you know, which uh, partners to partner up. And, uh, you know, in many cases, like, you know, in Norway, for example, uh, we will be bringing jobs, we will be bringing know-how, same thing in Canada, same thing in Georgia. So we have seen governments super receptive, uh, you know, welcoming with uh, open arms and seeing that this is the technology of the future. And, uh, you know, the investments are creating jobs, the investments are uh, creating transfer of, uh, you know, knowledge uh, and technology. And in our cases, uh, uh, we have uh, had very a very warm reception. Huh. And and you haven't had any I mean I guess you're you're choosing the governments that you think will already be open to working with you. That's correct. Okay. Well, we will see how uh the government reaction unfolds um over the next few years. Well, thanks so much uh to both of you for coming on the show. Thank you. Thank you for your time, Laura. Thanks, Laura. And before we go, actually where can people get in touch with you or or see your work? Which kind of? <laughs> what kind of work? Yeah, what kind of work? Or, a, or a, just learn more about blockchain. the theory. <laughs> I mean, obviously on our website and, uh, you know, we're quite accessible. So doors are always open for, uh, for interested parties. Great. Well, thanks to both of you again for coming on the show. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. Take care. Thanks so much for joining us today. To learn more about Val and George, check out the show notes inside your podcast episode. New episodes of Unchained come out every Tuesday. If you haven't already, rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts. If you liked this episode, share it with your friends on Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Unchained is produced by me, Laura Shin, with help from Elaine Zelby, Daniel Nuss, and Fractal Recording. Thanks for listening.